How y'all doing? All right. Well, I'm glad you asked. I'm happy in Jesus. I'm away to heaven, having the most wonderful time of my life. He is risen indeed. He is risen. There's, it looks pretty good, except for that section over here. I don't know. There's George. Thank you, George. It's like there's a plague over there, and they, they all got sick. Uh, Luke chapter 24 and Acts chapter 1. We're going to look at both places where Luke writes about the ascension this morning. I get thinking, you know, instead of just j- jumping right back into Philippians, I'm going to talk about the ascension today and uh, following the resurrection. It's very important uh, that we do so. Let's stand together. Verse 50, Luke 24, 50. And Jesus led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, and they worshiped him. And returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, praising and blessing God. Amen. That's how the book ends. And then Luke continues in the book of Acts. In chapter 1, interesting verse 8 talks about, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the end of the earth. And then he says, now when he had spoken, when Jesus had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Kind of interesting that two men appeared in the tomb in white apparel. Uh, who also so they're angels. Who also said, "Man of Galilee, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come, in like manner as you saw him go into heaven." And then they returned, and so on, went to the upper room, etc. Lord, we pray that you will. Guide our thought process today and and help us to switch gears from membership class to sermonizing this morning, (laughs) preaching. I pray that you will take from our mind things that we uh, have just racing around in there and help us now to focus on what you want to say to us from this passage and uh, breathe into our lives, Holy Spirit, speak to us. And help us to draw near to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Maybe may be seated. Have any of you ever been to Eureka Springs, Arkansas? I knew Sheila had. Eureka Springs, Arkansas, which is known for the great passion play. I don't know, a couple hundred actors and actresses, probably, live animals, uh, full spread. Uh, We saw it a couple times because Debbie's grandmother used to live in Gravit, which is, what, 10, 15-minute drive or some Eureka Springs, and so when we were going up there and she was still alive and lived in that area, we stayed at her house. She had this little mobile home trailer out in the back and in Arkansas, and, and, and it was musty in there because it's very humid, and she would never run the air conditioner unless she had company. Anyway, all that. <laughs> it's just the sights and smells of going to stay at Grandma's house. I just remember that, the musty trailer that we stayed in. Uh, but anyway, and then we would go over one of those nights and, and see the Passion Play. 
um, and take our girls. Um, it is an awesome scene. And uh, the life of, of Jesus, the city of Jerusalem, the soldiers, everything, the cross up on the hill, the three crosses, and um, Jesus praying in the garden, and then the ascension, where they take that actor, whoever he is, and they've got a wire with a, with a remote control somewhere, and they, I, I, I'm, he's got to be free of height problems, because man, they take him up until he disappears out of your sight, and you're going, whoop, uh, pretty cool, you got to go, so your family vacation, instead of going somewhere where you spend a lot of money on secular things, go drive by Eureka Springs, Arkansas, and see the Passion Play, amen. You can eat there, okay. Go see Sheila. When we went, it was 30 years ago, or 20, 25 or so years ago. So it's probably improved now. Probably have pyrotechnics and all the rest of the stuff. Who knows what they have? I doubt it. Uh, I, I just like the way it was. It was very simplistic, uh, set in that day and age. Um, the ascension of Christ occurred 40 days after the resurrection, 10 days before Pentecost. Um, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the church talks, we do so much about the birth and the life and the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, and we should. And how important they are and so on. But we talk less about the importance of the ascension of Jesus. Um, the gospel writers barely mention the ascension. They didn't see much importance in it, I guess, the fact that Jesus went to heaven was, would have been, to me, a big important thing. Um, but they didn't uh, write about it. Um, Matthew and John completely ignore it. Mark and Luke give it one sentence. Acts actually give us the most detail, but it is almost like Luke is using the ascension to connect the ending of Luke when he finishes the gospel, and then he ties it in to the beginning of Acts. Um, just nine verses into Acts. And so it's like, here's, I'm, I'm bringing you back. This is the connecting point, is the ascension. Um, and so, and then goes on into the church um, and the Acts of the Holy Spirit. So certainly the death and resurrection are the most important. Good Friday and Easter, the death and resurrection of Christ are the most important things about Jesus' life. More important than the birth more important than all of his teachings, as far as to us, is the fact that he brought salvation and sanctification and the eternal life. Um, the death and the resurrection of Jesus has got to be the climax, uh, no, no doubt about it. It is through them we're saved, sanctified, and, and given eternal life. But I would argue that although of a little lesser importance, the ascension of Jesus is still a pretty big deal. And so why? Well, fill in the blanks, and, and we're going to see. You know most of this stuff anyway, but it's a good reminder to us. Why is the ascension of Christ important? I put down four, four reasons. Uh, there's, as I was reading, there's five or six, but I combined them down to four because I think some of them are real similar. First is that Jesus ascended to be exalted. He ascended to be exalted. The verse in Mark that talks about the ascension, Mark 16, 19. So then, he says, after the Lord had spoken to them, the disciples, Jesus was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. So he does the whole thing in one sentence, um, one verse. Jesus ascended and sat down at the right hand of God. So the ascension showed his disciples and us that Jesus' earthly ministry was over. His human body was replaced by a glorified image that he shared with the Father before the world began. Remember, we're created in the image of God. Whatever that image is, he assumed it again. 
And um, he was once again exalted, immortal, celestial, spiritual. His physical earthly body ministry was over. His eternal ministry, which had been put on hold for 34 years, if you count his pregnancy, (laughs) uh, had now been resumed as he is now taking up his part as the third part uh, in the Godhead. He's joined the Trinity again. And his glorified body which he has changed back from the earthly body, which he had for those 34 years, is a type of the transformation that's going to occur when we receive, as Christians, a glorified body to live in heaven forever. You can't live in this body in heaven. This body won't work there. Why won't this body work there? Because we're now living in a two-dimensional world. But when you get to heaven, you're going to be living in a three-dimensional world. So begin to think about that. You need a body that will exist in that kind of a world because heaven is a cube. Read it. It's three-dimensional. Streets can go up and down as well as east and west, north and south. They, They go in all directions. And so, therefore, it's a different world than what we've imagined. And so it's going to take a different body when we get there. Now, those of you who like to think, think about that for a while. You want to keep this old body anyway? You think you're so cute? Wait until you got a body that's glorified. Yeah. Ooh, look at me then. But you guys are going to be cute as me. When we all get to heaven, we're going to look perfect. We're going to be perfect. We're going to act perfect. All right, so that's important. His glorified body reminds us that we will one day be glorified. Um, And so at the ascension of Jesus, uh, Jesus was exalted to a position of authority. Not only is his earthly ministry over, but he now has a position of authority. Where Where did he sit down? At the right hand of the Father. Okay. And as Jesus commissioned his disciples in Matthew 28, 18, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go and make disciples of all nations and so on. So he introduces the great commission by saying, all authority has been given to Jesus. And Jesus assumed universal, unlimited power at his ascension. His place at the right hand of God shows his divine omnipotence, the all-powerful one. And he was restored to its full potential and his full might. Everything that God can do, Jesus does because he is God, fully restored, totally in power as the resurrected, ascended Lord. And from this position of authority and power, Jesus is the head over the church. That's what the Bible says, what Paul writes. He's the head of the body. The body has many members, and we all work for the kingdom, right? Everybody doing their part. Praying and working and planning and teaching and whatever. And like the disciples, Christians today are to follow his instructions and his example because he is the head and we're the body. He is the king, we're the servants, so on. This exaltation of Christ is probably best described by Paul in Philippians 2.9, which they read in our call to worship this morning, about therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Our exalted Lord will be the Savior, the Lord, the King, the Judge, before whom we will all come and stand before and bow before in heaven. Every knee is going to bow before him. Every tongue is going to say, you know what, Jesus, you're Lord. I was wrong. If they're non-Christians. If they're Christians, they're going to say, yes, Jesus is Lord. 
Can you do that? In your glorified body, you'll be able to do it. So check it out. Practice. All right. Get your splits. Jesus ascended to be exalted. Number two, Jesus ascended to give us the Holy Spirit. One of the reasons Jesus went up is so the Holy Spirit could come down. If the ascension makes you think that Jesus is far away, sitting there in one location at the right hand of the Father, and that's the only place, and separated from us forever, think again, because Jesus is the unseen presence living in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Where the Father is, the Son is. Where the Son is, the Holy Spirit is. They are one. And so we use different words to explain it, but it doesn't really matter. He gave us the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit is interesting. (laughs) Because as a human, Jesus is physically limited to one location at a time. He walked with his disciples. He was in Jericho. They were in Jericho. And then they would go to Bethlehem, they were in Bethlehem. They would go to Jerusalem, they were in Jerusalem. They'd go up to Galilee, to Capernaum. They were in one place at a time. That's pretty limiting, which means if Jesus is one place at a time, if he's in my heart, he's not in yours. We can follow him around if he was in Brazil and was here this morning. Well, what about the people in Clay City or Corey or anywhere else? And so it's much better that the Holy Spirit came, and that is why in John 16, 7, Jesus said, To his disciples, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And so where Jesus is physically limited to one location, as the Spirit, Jesus is spiritually present everywhere, in every heart, that is a Christian, all at the same time. So all the Christians here today have Jesus in their heart. Can you feel him? Through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is representing Jesus to each one of us, the one who saves us, the one that lives within us. Um, And so this is so cool. Since Jesus' earthly ministry is over, it's time for the Holy Spirit to begin his ministry. What was the Spirit's ministry? To continue the work Jesus Christ started on earth. How does the Holy Spirit do that work and continue it? Through you and I. We continue the work Jesus started. In fact, the last words of Jesus before his ascension, according to Acts 1.8, were, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you shall. So you shall receive power. You shall be witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And he says, Judea, you know, Samaria, Jerusalem, so on. Uh, to the end of the earth. We forget. We like, you shall receive power. But we tend to put a period there and forget that you shall be witnesses. The Holy Spirit comes not only to give us the enablement to live like Jesus, but enables us to live like Jesus so we can live the life out there and be witnesses. Oh, okay, I guess I'll be a witness then. All right, we're witnesses Amen. for Jesus. Now, I don't know if you get the connection here. I didn't at first. Someone had to spell it out for me. So let me help you understand. And I'm already trying to drive this in that certain direction because why was the Holy Spirit given to help carry out the work of Jesus which was to bring the message of salvation to everyone, starting in Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That was the work. And bring salvation. So how does the Spirit bring salvation to the ends of the earth? Say me. Me? Me? Not you, me. Because it's nice to say you, and then we, th- we send money to the missionaries. You, and we pay the pastor. Or you, we, 
No, it's me. Everybody's a me. And he does it through me. All right, all right. He empowers Christians to witness about what? Jesus. Do you know the story of Jesus? You should be able to tell the story of Jesus. Do you know the story of what Jesus has done in you? You should be able to tell that story. You don't have to have a degree. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to memorize the entire Bible. But if you can tell the story of Jesus, he was born of a virgin, raised in blah, 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 taught and did this and that, and died on a cross, rose again, ascended into heaven, and he's now living within my heart because I came to the cross of Jesus and asked him into my heart, and he saved me and took away my sins. And wouldn't you like that happen to you? That is what you have to do. That's what you have to share. That's it. Tell the story of Jesus. So the work of Jesus is carried on by his disciples who share the good news. And it is the job of the Holy Spirit to help those witnessing disciples, those who are sharing the message of salvation to the lost. Do you get this? He empowers those who witness. Well, I don't feel empowered. Have you ever tried witnessing? He sends the Holy Spirit, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on to you, and you shall be my witnesses. You you don't get the power unless you do something. Why would God empower a car that sits there in the driveway and it's not turned on? There's no power there. But when the car gets out of the driveway and starts driving around, the power comes, right? Because it's doing what it's designed to do. And you are designed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus in you, to do the work of the kingdom of God, which is teaching inside the church, encouraging inside the church, helping inside the church, ministering, praying inside the church, but also finding a way to get out to somebody you know needs Jesus. Well, I don't know anybody that needs Jesus You don't know anybody who needs Jesus? Pray a simple prayer. Lord, show me somebody who needs Jesus. And then drive down your street for about two houses. All right. So the Spirit did not come to empower me to do what I want to do with my life. That's where we're messed up today. Christians think the Holy Spirit empowers me to do what I want to do. Give me strength today to do what I want to do. No, give me strength today to do what God wants me to do. That is what he does. He continues the work of Jesus in us. He empowers us to do that. That's a big difference The Spirit lives inside me to enable me to do His work, not my work, but His work. And that's a big difference. Christians are saved, called, instructed, commissioned, and empowered for one main task, to share Jesus Christ to sinners. Could be your family. Talk to my daughter about Jesus this week. We've got to do it, folks. Because if they don't have anybody else in their life who's telling them about Jesus, and you don't have to say a lot, because the Lord's working on the other end. Are we giving the important task the effort it requires? Read about the ministry of the Holy Spirit according to Jesus in John chapter 14, 15, and 16. His job is to replace Jesus on earth, convict the world of sin. So that's his job. He's out there. Before you even go and talk to them about Jesus, he's already convicting. That's his job. And to guide the Christian into all truth and to empower the Christian for witnessing. That's his job. And he lives within you. This is what he wants to do through you. So Jesus ascended to give us the Holy Spirit. The third thing, Jesus ascended to take up a ministry 
of intercession. You knew this one was coming. This may be your favorite thing about the ascension, the fact that the exalted Christ has a ministry of prayer, that he, amongst all the other things he's doing, is praying for you. I think about that. That God assigned Jesus the task of praying for me and you. And probably the moment when you're going through the crisis the most, he's probably mentioning your name right at that moment. I, I, there's no doubt in my mind he is. If you're his child, it's like the lost sheep he goes and hunts for. You know, if somebody's in trouble, he's out there to help that sheep. If it's, if it's in, in the brambles, he's going to go get it out of the brambles. That's what Jesus does. We're talking about the 23rd Psalm on Wednesday night. You know, the shepherd goes wherever the sheep need him. And he rescues them, and he cleans them up, and he fixes them up. And then he takes them to the still waters and the green pastures and all the other things. But he takes care of his sheep. And one of the things he does is prays for you. Romans 8, 34, it is God who, uh, Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen. So he's risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. That's the job of Jesus. Well, what does he pray for? I'm glad you asked. Hebrews 7.25 states that Jesus prays for the sinner. Jesus is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is interceding for the sinner. So not only is he praying for the Christian, he's praying for the people that you're trying to reach. If Jesus is praying for them, and you are telling them the story of Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is convicting them of their sin, guess what? The fields are ripened to harvest. We need to scatter some seed. All right. So he prays for the sinner. 1 John 2, 1 says that he prays for the Christians even when we sin. <laughs> Because John writes that we should not sin, but if we would, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have that advocate sitting at the right hand of the Father. When we mess up, he's right there saying, give him another chance. Aren't you glad? You ever, you ever mess up? Aren't you glad Jesus is praying for you to get back? All right. And then... He prays about our personal struggles. Uh, Hebrews 4.15, Jesus is our intercessory high priest. And he's, Hebrews uh, likens him, one of his, one of his likens is, is to uh, the high priest. Who can, and, and the high priest's job is to be the intermediator between humans and, and God. And he says he can sympathize with our weaknesses because he is in all areas of life, tempted as we are yet without sin. So here he is, our high priest. He knows. He was here. He knows what it is to be tempted. He knows what it is to have the problems of life. And he is there sympathizing with us. And he never gave in to sin, even though we did. So how much better to have him praying for us in our weaknesses. I need it. It is a blessing to know that Jesus prays for me and he prays for you. He wants us to be saved. He wants us to stay saved. He wants us to become stronger as Christians. He wants us to grow. He wants us to resist temptation. He wants us to make it to heaven. Jesus wants you to be that Christian. He's praying for that. So the question becomes, what am I doing? What are you doing to answer Jesus' prayers? If he is praying for us so that we will resist temptation, why are we going out there to the place of temptation? If he is praying for us that if we would fall back into sin, that we'd get, why do we keep falling back into the same sins? Answer his prayer. Make some changes. I followed a white car through town on Thursday. Suzuki, white Suzuki, in front of me. And coming up 59, and turned right on 40. I was on my way to the office and followed this car. 
the decal in the back window said, I love Jesus. Great. The next line said, but I cuss a little. Didn't look exactly like that, but similar. And I was going, hey, that's kind of funny. Yeah, I'm, I love Jesus, but I've got an issue in my life. And then I got to thinking about it. After all, nobody's perfect. We all have some area that needs improvement. Cussing isn't that big of a deal on the scale of murder or something else you can think of. Uh, what's wrong with lying? I love Jesus, but I, I lie a little. White lies, gray lies, not black ones. I love Jesus, but I, uh, I lust a little. I love Jesus, but I steal a little. I love Jesus, but I hate a little. Now you begin to see they're making an excuse for something they know is wrong, right? What is this person really saying? Imagine if the decal said, I love my wife, but I cheat on her a little. Does he really love his wife? I don't know if it's a woman or a guy. Probably a gal. <laughs> it's a white car, you know. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, or you say, I love my job, but I occasionally lie about my hours and, and steal company supplies and a little. It never amazed me. This is the second time this happened. Just recently, I'm, I'm working out in the Y. Somebody, somebody new was in there, and they said, what are you doing in here? Oh, I'm, I'm working from home today. <laughs> the clock in at their house, supposed to be doing their work there, and now they're at the gym. And I'm like, busted. I wish I knew your boss. I knew what company you worked for, but I didn't get into it. I just, I love my job, but... Or, I love my tomcat, but I feed him some rat poison once in a while. Just to see how it affects him. You know, slow him down a little bit. And we begin to think about this. Can a person say, I love Jesus, but? And then consider it humorous? Because whatever follows the but is known by that person to be wrong behavior, and so it reflects badly on who? Not them. On the character of the person they love. Which then in turn reflects badly on them. So we're asking, we're, we're thinking about Jesus interceding for us every day, and this person doesn't have enough confidence in the prayer of Jesus Christ to help them with the problem that they know is wrong. In fact, they're going against Jesus praying for them by actually continuing to do what they know is wrong and making it the excuse. Is it really love for Jesus if I continue to do something I know is wrong? If I really loved Jesus, wouldn't I try to do the things that please him? And wouldn't I be ashamed of the things that hurt Jesus? Don't I want to represent him better to the world? Because they're confused when I say I love Jesus and then I lie. Somehow I fail to see the humor and the philosophy of life that says I can love Jesus and live life how I want. Because when I understand the death on the cross, it is that it changes us completely. Old is gone, the new has come. And I speak from a person who had a foul mouth at one time in my life. I know you can change. Jesus can help us. Jesus died for us to be saved. Jesus is praying for you and me to improve as a Christian. 
How can we joke about our sins and carry on like it's no big deal? Stop making excuses and start making the changes that God is praying for us to make. Help you out, Lord, today. You help me to work on this. I keep lying. It just comes out. But Lord, help me. We develop our habits, then our habits make us who we are. Jesus is praying for you and I. What are we changing? How are we growing so that his prayers will be answered? So it's one thing to think, oh, warm fuzzies, that Jesus prays for me every day. Therefore, he's going to help me through temptations and trials and situations of life. I've got him there. But it's another thing to say, how do I answer his prayer? Right? You ever think about that? Because God himself is praying for you to do better and to be better. And we go on, we're like, that's no big deal. Just help me out of my crisis. That's what I want you to do. God wants to help you to grow. Amen. That's the kind of God he is. He wants you to be better today than you were two weeks ago. Amen. That's good preaching, even if it is for me. Can I improve? Can you improve? Is Jesus praying for us to improve? Can I help him answer that prayer? Duh. Start improving. So Jesus ascended to take up the ministry of intercession. Number four, Jesus ascended to prepare for his second coming. Acts 1.11, at the ascension of Christ, the two angels told the disciples... Why do you stand here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, <laughs> who is taken up from you to heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. He's going to come again out of the clouds in the sky, just like you saw him go up into the clouds, into the universe, wherever he went, to wherever heaven is. So Jesus had to ascend up so that he can soon return back down to earth at the second coming of Christ. Oh, there's a lot. That's a whole sermon. But in the meantime, Jesus is actively making preparation for our arrivals. You think God is, is busy? He's going around everywhere, living inside of us through the Holy Spirit, helping us to tell the story of Jesus. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father in authority over the church, giving us directions on what to do. He's also, while he's there, praying for all of us and the sinners that should take him a, a couple hours a day, probably. Cover the entire world, sinners and saints and everybody. How many billions now? Six? Seven? Of course, he doesn't go by hours. And then on top of that, it says in John 14, verse 3, he told his disciples that, let not your heart be troubled, <laughs> Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house is many mansions. If we're not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. And so he's, he's busy building a place in heaven for us. I think God keeps pretty busy, don't you? Of course, he can speak stuff into existence instantly. I understand that. Still, it has to be spoken into existence. And he's doing that so that where I am, there you may be also. He wants us to be with him forever in heaven. And so what a promise. He's coming again, my friends, and some of us may die before he returns. But for those who are alive, Jesus is returning like a groom to take his bride to a home prepared for us in heaven. I was talking to my dad yesterday on the phone. I do every Saturday that I can. Uh, and we're talking about, you know, getting older and somebody that he knows died and they're going to a funeral this week. You know, and it's on his mind a lot because mom's been gone. And he's living all alone. And everybody's in the, oh, this is going to be a tough for that family and all this. I said, no, it's not. <laughs> not if you're a Christian. We have the wrong idea, folks. We hold too strongly to this world. We are created for heaven. 
He's preparing a place for us called heaven. That's where we're designed to go. That's where we want to go. No, I'm going to hold on. Everything I've got right here because this is all. No, ladies and gentlemen, don't hold on to your mamas and daddies and let them go. Be with Jesus. They're done. We get so wrapped up in this world. You know what the Bible says about this world? In this world, you will have trouble. Well, keep mom here a little longer so she can have more trouble. Because when I saw her, she was trouble. She wasn't herself. She wasn't happy. She couldn't eat right. Pocketing her food and then picking it out later. And th- that wasn't my mom. It was time for her to go. Why do we hold them here when God is calling them there? Rejoice and be glad. Your home is in heaven. Your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. And that's what your goal is. And you and I are going to join them. Don't hold on to me, ladies and gentlemen. Don't grab my ankles. I'm going. Don't hold me down. I want to go to heaven when my time comes. I'm not ready yet. But when that train comes and the horn sounds, that long black train, I'm whoop. I'm getting in, because I want to go. Oh, I'll miss people. Two or three people will cry for me, but I'm going to be in heaven. And God's the first thing he's going to do is, says he's going to wipe every tear from my eye, and then I'm going to start skipping down the golden streets, and if I can find a, a pebble or two, I'm going to skip them across the lake. What are you going to do? And I'm going to spend about a year or two at the feet of Jesus. And I'm going to hang out waiting for Debbie to show up 15 years later. (laughs) Women always last 15 years longer than guys. You ever notice? Anyway, not 15. It don't matter. And then wait till my girls show up. And you know how long it's going to seem when you're in heaven? And they'll be there. (laughs) Because there's no time there, no days and nights, just Jesus. Well, it's a lot to say. Jesus ascended to prepare for a second coming. And for those of us who don't die, <laughs> the trumpet's going to sound. Woo! You talk about a day. What a day that will be. That trumpet's going to (laughs) sound. All of us, we're already going to be there, the dead ones. But the live that are left are just going to kind of, wherever heaven is, they're going to show up, and it's going to be over. Over, folks. Victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. And the angels are going to sit there and go, whoop. Fold their wings, because only we can sing the song of salvation. Jesus died on the cross for me, for you. I hope this morning that you understand just how important the ascension of Jesus is. He, he still saves, he still sanctifies, oh, super important. But because of the ascension, he's also our exalted Lord who sent us the Holy Spirit, who prays for us nonstop, and who is making preparations for his soon return in our life in heaven forever. That is Jesus, exalted, ascended, celestial, eternal. And I want to ask you important questions. In what ways are you worshiping the exalted Lord this morning? Did you get up grumpy-faced? Or did you get up to worship Jesus? Thanking him that he allowed you to come this morning. In a few minutes, we're going to be singing some hymns. Did you feel God's presence as we were singing earlier? That's worshiping Jesus. That's what we're here for. All right, so we can do that. Are you answering God's call to be empowered by the Holy Spirit, to be witnessing and witnesses to the sinners in your life, in your community, in your family? Find a way. Pray about it. God will open the door and slide it in there. Can I tell you, I've been praying for you, that Jesus loves you. He died for you. 
and he can help you just as he helped me. Get that witnessing in there. And then, what improvements are you making in your life so that Jesus' prayers for you can be answered? If God is praying for you and showing you things, that's his answer to the prayer. He's showing you things that we need to improve. Let's just work on them, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever it is. I'm not picking on any particular thing. But there's an area in your life that you're just dragging your feet on. And God says, I've been praying that you get, get through this. And you're going to say, yes, let's work on that. Help me today, Lord. Well, I failed today. Well, tomorrow's a new day. Do it again. How do you make good habits? One day at a time. They don't become habits immediately. You have to work at them. And then what preparation are you making so that you're going to be ready when Jesus returns? It's good stuff. Ascension of Jesus Christ is for us. It's family altar time. Again, the praise team comes. We're going to open the altar. We want you to come and pray. Even if you're in the praise team, you can pray. You know that, don't you? Anybody can pray. Everyone can pray. Talk to Jesus. Give him your problems. Help him answer your prayers. Help him answer his prayers. Make changes in your life. Start this morning. Worship him. Talk to him. He's right there. Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning. As we open up the altar this morning, would you have your way in our hearts? Help us to say yes to you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Thank you, Lord, for this time together. Thank you, Lord, for your spirit speaking. Thank you, Lord, for praying for us today. Thank you, Lord, for praying for the lost. Thank you for praying about us in our situations, our issues, our problems. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to do something about them. Starting today, we're going to be different. We're going to be better. With your help, we're going to make changes. Starting today, Lord, we're going to think about witnessing a little more. Starting today, Lord, we're going to think about heaven a little more. We want to be where you are, Lord. Help us to not get so bound up in this old world, but help us to be free to go. Our time is coming. It may come soon. Help us to be ready. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are the exalted one right now. You have authority over our lives. You have authority over the church. Help us to obey you as you speak to us. Not my will, but your will be done, Lord Jesus. I ask, Lord, today, show me, guide me in our relationships and in every area of our life. Would you guide us, Lord? Fill us with your presence. Fill us with more of you. Help us, Lord, just to be full of God, the fullness of God. Help us to get deeper in the things of God. Help us to grow daily. Help us to be more like our master. Help us to follow you to the end. Be with those recovering from surgeries. Be with those, Lord, that are struggling with issues and relationships and questions. Help them to bring them to the feet of Jesus and surrender to you. I pray, Lord, for the financial needs. I pray, Lord, for our community for our state, for our country, for our world. Lord, it's easy to pray about the big things, but sometimes it's the little things in our own life that are the hardest to pray about. So Lord, we want to pray about those tonight, those little things. <laughs> Help us to surrender them to you. Be in the missionary service tonight up in Rockville. Be with the Corey prime time gathering tomorrow night down in Cory. Lord, just be with us as we assemble back on Wednesday. Be in the prayer groups as they meet this week. Be in the children's meetings and the teen meetings this week. Lord, we just pray that you will have all of us because we want all of you. Thank you, Lord, for our time of worship. 
Help us as we partake of communion in a few minutes. We just love you, Jesus. Thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon. If you're looking for a church in the Brazil, Indiana area, the Brazil Church of the Nazarene invites you to join us as we seek him, celebrate him, and serve him. Sunday morning, we have Sunday school at 9 a.m. and worship at 10 a.m. During worship, we have We Worship for preschool-aged kids and a children's church for elementary-aged kids. For this information, news, a schedule of events, and more, please visit us online at brazilnaz.com. That's B-R-A-Z-I-L-N-A-Z dot com. Or visit us in person at 1002 East National Avenue in Brazil. Thank you and God bless.